kid. Are you ready to go to the ballpark? I'm ready to go to the ballpark. Let's go. Let's go, baby. Let's go. Back when you were 25. I was 25 years old. 25 years old. Okay, you... wait a minute. 25 years old. Let me see how old am I now? <laughs> Jeez. Okay, go ahead. You took a very important drive from New York and you got 100 miles into Pennsylvania and you made an important decision oh. <laughs> that affected the rest of your life. Can you tell us about it? I think it was the second or third time that I had got sent down from the big leagues to AAA. It came at a time where uh, my wife Bonnie and I were expecting our first child. So you know that you can do the job. And, and the night that they sent me down, I was in the bullpen and Cloyd Boyer, who was the pitching coach at the time, he said, look, I got to tell you, uh, when you get to the locker room, they're probably going to send you down again. And I asked uh, Claude, I said, Claude, why? And he, he looked at me and he put his head down and he said, because you're not pitching. And you're going like, well, if I'm here, how can I pitch if they don't use me? When I left the ballpark, I made the decision that I was going home because I, I had enough. I was 25, 26 years old with a child on the way, no set job, you know, and you can't be unsure about your future. So I, I wanted to really do something, you know. So when I got home, I, like I said, I was upset and I told Bonnie, we packed the clothes, you know, um, we're going home. So she never said a word and we took off, we got in the car and we drove. And about five miles from Interstate 81 and 80 in right out of Harrisburg, Pennsylvania. There's the sign. It says five miles Harrisburg. And it shows you the interstate sign. It says 81, North Syracuse, South Virginia. So, you know, I had always taken a right on that thing, but I was planning <laughs> to go home. And when we hit that sign, she knew, you know, five miles. No, it's a, it's, it passes by fast when, you, when you're going 80 miles an hour. So she turned around and she looked at me and she said, you know, if you quit, she says, this is the first time I'll have ever known you to quit something before you prove to yourself you could do it or not. And she said, well, look, I'm, I'm willing to do it at least one more time. If it doesn't work, then you do what you want. And if you want to go home, that's fine. So when I got to the intersection, I made the right, I went to Syracuse, it was two weeks, I went back up, and things kind of changed from that point on, but that's the story. I came close, you know, to not having a career, to having a fairly good career. Now, if you made that left, we wouldn't be here today. Probably not. <laughs> <laughs> but don't ask me what I'd be doing. Yeah. Do you think you ever would have gotten into food? Because I know from stories that you've shared before that you're a pretty big crawfish guy and you bring some of your own food well, to that, the clubhouse for some of the guys, Yeah, right? but all of that is just because of the food that we have and, and you know, learning how to cook and stuff. We always had done that uh, throughout my playing career. I always had food because being from Louisiana with all of that good food, you know, everybody talks and hears about the gumbos and the etouffees and the you know, the crawfish and everything else that we have that we're noted for. I make sure I bring a little bit of Louisiana with me. Okay. When people talk about crawfish, a lot of times they're talking about the ball crawfish because that's what you see, mm -hmm. you know, the trays that are thrown on the table and the crawfish flying all over the place. That's just boiled crawfish. Mm -hmm. uh, to be able to do that, you're talking about getting hundreds of pounds or you're talking about sacks of crawfish, mm -hmm. and then you boil them yourself. What's the largest amount of crawfish that you've had at one time that you've prepared yourself? We have a boiler that has, you can hold 100 pounds. Okay. So like, a, you know, and most of the time you do this, you, it's just for your family mm -hmm. or friends. If we had it like for the Super Bowl, say, say live crawfish would be coming out the same time as the Super Bowl. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, we're gonna watch the Super Bowl, let's have a big crawfish bowl. So you get 200 pounds, you get six, seven, eight sacks of crawfish, and then what you do is you boil 100 pounds at a time because 100 pounds is gonna feed 20 people. Yeah. Okay, so what you do is you throw all of that on the table, but as soon as you throw it on the table, you start cooking the other 100 pounds. So by the time people are finished 
eaten 100 pounds, you got another 100 pounds to throw. So crawfish are, I would say, fairly easy to eat. I mean, definitely tough to clean. They'll be easy, and I clean them quick. I eat them. <laughs> you might not be able to, you know. You know Cleaning yeah. them took me a while when you, I tried with Yeah, the you know, you, you grab the whole crawfish, you take it, you bend the tail out, you pop the tail off, and, you know, you can suck the head if you want. Uh -huh. You know, people suck the head. You know, it's one of the rituals. They suck the head. You throw the top half away. You take the tail. You tear off the end of the tail. Uh -huh. And if you do it right, usually, when you tear the tail off and you pull the tail apart, it usually takes out the intestine, mm -hmm. the vein. Yes. Okay? So you take that out, then you fold it over and you, you pinch it. And it cracks the, sh the, sh the tail shell, and then you just split it open, you pop it in your mouth, and you go on to the next one. How about frogs? Oh, yeah. That I know for being fast. Can you catch a frog? Yeah. Oh, yeah. I've done, yeah. You go out at night with a, with a spotlight. The guy drives a boat. You get in the front. And you have a spotlight on your head. Now it's a powerful light. It's not just like a, a little flashlight that has a, a 10 watt beam. Mm -hmm. You're talking about a light that probably is a thousand candle, uh, two, three, four thousand watt candle light. So when you hit a frog, it freezes. I mean, it, you know, it, it's blinded by the glare because they, they most of the time they sit like on a lily pad, uh, on the on the saw grass on the rosal weed, on the matted grass in ponds, in, um, in marshes, in bayous. They'll be sitting on the side somewhere. So you go at night and the guy drives a boat. And if you see one, you just hit that frog with that light and he just freezes. And as the boat passes, you, you just grab it. Wow. Yeah, by your hand. It would, uh, I'd be a little bit careful though. But, you know, you gotta know the eye width that we always tell everybody else, you know, alligators have a certain width between the eyes. You know, water moccasins have a certain width between the eyes. Frogs have a certain width. So you, if you learn the width of the eyes, you got you get a good idea of what is what. Dude, this is so awesome. <laughs> so, <laughs> so yeah, but when you talk about it, I'll I scare more guys than anything else because I mean, you know. Look, everybody, you know, everybody gets concerned about, oh, you, you know, you're in the marsh, you're in the swamp, you know. I've gone out and caught 50, 100. Well, I got enough after that. <laughs> I mean, d don't forget, yeah. somebody's got to clean them, all right? And catching them is very easy. Cleaning them is not so fun. And then, of course, the cooking part after. Yeah, no, that's fun. When you're cooking and eating, you're not worried about the catching and cleaning. Like, I'm sure you heard the stories about when I bring the frog legs here. Yes. There are guys here that just go crazy over the frog legs. And that's an experience for them that you provide for them yeah. that they can't get anywhere else, so that you're doing something special for them. Yeah. My dad used to come to uh, Arlington when we'd play the Rangers, and he'd bring like 300 frog legs. And we had a place at a hotel the management at the hotel used to give us tables, chairs, a security guard, and a, and they put us under this big old tree. And my dad would fry all those frog legs up, and we they had 15 guys there from the team eating frog legs. And it carried over, you know, as time passed, uh, a lot of guys weren't there anymore, you know, my teammates, but new teammates came and new teammates heard the stories, wanted to try them. So we were still cooking hundreds of frog legs for, for the guys that were there. You know, to make a friend from California or Washington or Utah or Delaware or Maine, I know that they don't have frogs up there, mm -hmm. okay? But to watch <laughs> these guys tear into some fried frog legs was hysterical. Yeah. They'd actually quarrel over the frog legs. <laughs> And over the last several years, you've had a lot of them who have retired, like Posada and Rivera and Sabathia. Out of all the past teammates that you've had, or even maybe somebody right now, which of the guys has eaten the most frog legs in one sitting? Goose. Goose, okay. Goose, okay. Yeah. Do not stick your hand in front of goose <laughs> <laughs> if they have frog legs on the table. <laughs> How many could he take down? <laughs> I never counted, but he'll eat <laughs> more than anybody. Oh, yeah. He'll eat more than anybody. I'm going to guess what type of car that you probably drove, but I'm going to say I picture you driving like a 
pickup truck. Flatbed or something in the back. Well, we had a station wagon. All right, there that, you go. That, when I was small. <laughs> yeah, it's kind of like that. My dad had a station wagon. Was it one of those station wagons where it had a about, third row seat yeah. where you're kind of looking at? Did you yeah. sit back there And you lot? can sit in the back, and we had no air conditioning. You had to open up the back glass, and you, you put down the windows on the side, and you travel 60 miles an hour. You'd feel like you were in a wind tunnel. <laughs> you know, that was great. That was, yeah, that was air conditioning. How old were you, and what made you want to learn to play the drums? Because you've played with the Beach Boys before, so obviously you, you've gotten pretty good over the years. I learned how to play when I was in a, a teenager. A bunch of the guys around the neighborhood that played, you know, we, we had a little band, so we'd start playing on, in, in certain times, like on the weekend, and you'd make a few dollars. Mm -hmm. And as you grow older, you start doing the same thing. In the minor leagues, I never did anything with them. But like when we moved to Yankee Stadium, I was talking to Jimmy Esposito, who was our head groundskeeper at the time. So one afternoon, Jimmy was unloading all of these carts of the giveaway stuff. And when I passed him, I looked in and this, this was a huge room at the stadium. So I just walked in there. I was talking to the guys moving the stuff. I even asked them if they wanted some help. No, no, no. So. As I as I, I walked around, I, I noticed that you know, like the room itself went far in the back, and then I could see some more room on the left. Mm -hmm. It started to to go into my head. That'd be a perfect place for, for me to get <laughs> my drum set over here. Playing the drum keeps your wrist very strong. I could work out with my wrist, and it, it's one of the things that people don't know why I was so successful in throwing sliders. Mm -hmm. Because as hard as I snapped my wrist, it would, they were always strong enough. I don't know if I wouldn't have played if it would have been as good as it was without working out with them. Because I could play every day and go out and pitch and it never bothered. It just exercise. There's nothing there. there you know, the wrist is a is a place that hardly anything ever happens to. Mm -hmm. Now, you might get arthritis when you're 60, 70 years old, but you're done by then. You don't yeah. care. Yeah, so, but it, it, it did what it was supposed to for the time that I was there. For me as a pitcher who snaps off, you know, it, it, it that was right up my alley. But anyway, I started thinking about getting my drums and then I decided, well, you know what? I'm gonna talk to Bonnie, I'm gonna ask her if I can spend a little money and I'm gonna buy me a new set up here to where I don't have to worry about. It. So I talked to her and she said, sure, you know, do it. Yeah, that's what you'd like. Rolling up to the field right now, does this ever get old? Mm, no. Because when you drive up here, you start remembering the things that are really fun. Mm -hmm. And the, the thing is, it, you know, the, the game itself is fun, but it's the camaraderie of the guys that you meet, uh, all the friendships that you make, mm -hmm. uh, and you're able to pick them up again because the old stories start coming out again. Uh, the time that you spend here, uh, the learning that uh, the teaching that you 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 know the teaching that you can give the learning that you still receive mm -hmm. because things change all the time so you know like to stay on top of what's going on today there's so much more knowledge that's here today than what we had mm -hmm. but it's fun to listen and you know now you can acquire it you can pass it on and you don't feel like a like a tortoise, if they ask you a question and it's about today, mm -hmm. okay? They'll ask you questions about what you did, but we didn't have all of this, you know, stuff that they have today. But if you're paying attention in the meetings and you're watching them work, if a young kid asks you about them, you can relate to them. You're not going like, oh, hey, let me go see. I don't you know. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, you don't appear to be an idiot. You know? <laughs> What does this guy know? This guy is too old. You know, that's the kind of stuff. Yeah. But like I said, it's the, it, it's the, um, like us, we're laughing. It's the camaraderie that goes on. You know, like that sign says right there. It says Yankees. Mm -hmm. that it doesn't signs, get any better. It's a, that, it, that has more clout than <laughs> most other signs you see. Well, the thing that I love most about you and I appreciate your time is, is one thing that you said that really sticks out is respect. You give it 
and that's how you earn it. And and I hope everybody at home who's watching this I hope takes so that too. valuable lesson and applies it because that is how you gain that respect that you have right now and the reason why you're still here today. I hope so because if somebody ever meets my mom or my dad and they tell them that, oh, your son is disrespectful, I can still hear that china ball tree. And my, when mom wanted to, to tan my behind because I did something wrong, and I'm still, af I'm more afraid of my mom today than my dad. <laughs> because mom used to get that stick and, and you knew you were gonna get a whooping, but you could hear that stick as you were approaching the house. <laughs> Come here, Ronald Lane. You could hear that stick. Because if you're disrespectful down there, that's, uh, that's something that it, they don't wanna hear. Mm -hmm. Your parents don't wanna hear you disrespectful to anyone. Awesome, well, Ron, hey, thank you so much for your time, Gators. Okay, guys. Have fun day at the ballpark, all right? All right? I hope we did good. I don't know if they say this anymore, but hum boy, hum babe, let's get them. <laughs>